Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Turned Into Punk Classics, a show where we take old episodes of Turned Into Punk that have been lost from the internet and return them to their previous glory by sticking them back on the feed. You can find this podcast on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and all other forms of social media. Well, that's pretty much it. At Turned Into Punk, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Damien. I play in a band. More information can be found at F-U-C-K-E-D-U-P dot C-C. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy another TOAP classic. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, as I told you in message form that uh, I've wanted to do this since I was like 15 years old. <laughs> so this is a, a huge thrill to finally get to talk to you. Oh, thanks, Damien. I really appreciate you taking the time to to have any interest in a bunch of old guys. Oh, please. No, not even, not even. We'll get into, you know, as I, I don't know, I, I don't know if you've heard any of these before, but I always find a way to really shoehorn my way into everyone else's life story, yes. uh, which is uh, <laughs> something that I will undoubtedly wind up doing on this one as well. Uh, but, uh, before I do that, I guess I have to, uh, start it off by letting you start it off, which is how did you get into punk? Um, well, um, I, th- this, the short, simple answer is millions of dead cops. Do, do, um, was, do you remember your first, was that the first band you heard that you would describe as kind of punk rock or? Uh, no, I had heard, I had heard punk bands before that, but I hadn't heard millions of dead cops. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I, um, I was a metalhead. Yeah. And I was, I grew up in in the military and I was a reactionary right wing freak, uh, about, you know, 13 or 14 years old. Um, you know, I was pro, uh, nuclear proliferation. Uh, I was pro Reagan and our, our drummer, George, who was my childhood friend, um, kind of followed me on my metal journey and then he started to veer off and was more interested in these punk bands i didn't really pay attention at first and he invited me over to check out this record he got and it was a millions of dead cops record and he put it on and i was looking at the back of the record you know reading the titles john wayne was a nazi and listening to the lyrics and i just thought this is fucking bullshit what is this <laughs> fucking freak music you're listening to man and i said i'm not interested in this and and uh then i left <clears throat> And immediately went to the record store and bought the record <laughs> and, uh, and just sat there with it, uh, because something about it really, I, I mean, that record to this day, it comes on and it's a special moment in time, uh, never to be recaptured again. And, and it, it transformed me. Like I held up their view of the world to my view of the world and theirs was reality based mine was a fucking fantasy and that was just the the gateway uh into a whole new world of ideas and music that that record absolutely that that record was the cause of all this so what were the metal bands you were listening to prior to it like that were kind of speaking to kind of that more i guess uh right of center worldview shall we say uh they, they well most of the bands actually in retrospect you know venom raven mm-hmm. uh early metallica so like all the all the early '80s power metal, speed metal, as it existed back then, yeah. you know the old style old style black metal. Um, none of them really spoke to that. They actually were all confronting power and challenging illegitimate authority in their own special ways. But but because it wasn't it wasn't like the lyrics. It wasn't MDC. It wasn't yeah. MDC jumped out of the fucking speakers. Dave Dichter grabbed you by the throat. And, and just fucking hammered you over the head with these, what I thought were crazy ideas about the world that all turned out to be true. And, uh, and then I was able to actually look back on those records and see, you know, see the elements on a Raven record that were anti-war because I mean, it's, it's a popular, I hope a misconception, but a popular conception that, uh, a lot of metal bands lean more to the right, but it's not always true and if you really dig into a lot of lyrics it's they all come from the same place that the punk bands do just the punk bands were more direct i I think ian mckay has talked about this when he started minor threat he wanted to just 
talk very directly and very simply to people. And it was a real, it's a real different way of, of hearing a message to be hammered over the head with something. Yeah. So that really appealed to me at that point in my life, you know, as I was transforming from this little fucking potential military weirdo into a different kind of weirdo. Where, where why did you think that record got to that record store? Like it's got, it's like, well, it's a smaller town, right? Well, he, I think George ordered that one, uh, probably from, uh, what was that label? It was on our, Oh, our radical. radical. Yeah. I think he, he probably mail ordered that back then. And then I probably went into Winnipeg to fantastic records or records on wheels and, uh, grabbed it. You oh, know? So, yeah. So you were, so, I, for the, sorry, I guess for we, the metal stuff, you had to go into Winnipeg at this point. Anyway. Well, no, here's another crazy story. Portage La Prairie, mm. the small town we lived in had a sewing shop called Busy Fingers that people don't believe this, but it was a sewing shop and they sold speed metal. <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. And the, the, the owner who later was charged with some unsavory, uh, charges. Yeah. Uh, yeah. in regards to kids it gave me a key to the, to the record racks. Cause I spent so much time there. And luckily I didn't get in any sort of other trouble there, but, um, but I, I've got all my speed metal there in this fucking crazy little sewing shop in Portage La Prairie. Uh, it was very strange, but they had everything. They had all the bonsai stuff, all the Cobra stuff, all the uh, Mega Force stuff, imports. It was amazing. Bizarre. It was, was it? Was it, it was a better selection? It was a better selection than Records on Wheels had at the time in Winnipeg. Wow. So was he into that kind of stuff musically? I guess or no. He was. He was the the guy who no. The guy was like. I mean, I'm sure you you remember the episode of uh, Different, Different Strokes, Strokes where, <laughs> where the, the guy who owns the bike shop. Yeah. Uh, he looked like that guy. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was fucked up. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah, no, 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 no none taken. <laughs> um, so was there, so where do you think that came from? Was he just trying to get a certain type of youth? Not that you should speculate on this sort of stuff too, but like, it's just such a weird genre to gravitate towards. Yeah, I don't know. I, maybe maybe he misordered something. Yeah. And we, we wandered in and we're like, whoa, what the fuck? Iron Angel, where the hell did you get this? And then he just started ordering. Yeah. He came in every week. Yeah, of to course. To buy records. And so, yeah. So I guess, uh, but you went in to get the MDC record at this point. And so was it immediately that you kind of felt everything changed for you right after that record? Or was it sort of a slower process? I, it's probably slower than I remember. But yeah. I remember like I, I bought it with this, with a strange feeling of hostility, but knowing deep down that, um, the band, the message, the, the urgency to the record, uh, spoke to something that was possibly true about what the guy was saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it was, I had never heard, I mean, I, I had heard a lot of urgent, raw metal prior to that, but that record, the urgency in that record was something special. And I, and I, I, to this day, I think it's probably one of the top five most urgent sounding records that exists, uh -huh. um, at least in the genre. But uh, yeah, something really resonated with me and, and it still does today with that record. What a, what a crazy record to come out back then. Oh, amazing you know? record. It's funny too, when you hear about Dave Dichter talk about how all the cops that come up to him to get their photos taken with them <laughs> and stuff like that, written in interviews with her, he's like, yeah, cops are always asking for photos with me. It's that really is hilarious. I know. I'm like, wow, that's very bizarre. <laughs> and stuff like that. I've had cops come up to me at fucked up shows too. Like, Hey, that song police. And then they'll hand me a card. <laughs> like uh, two, twice as has happened, a benevolence police benevolence association card. And they're like, if you ever get pulled over, just hand this over with your license. Really? So, yeah. I need one of those. I know. We, and they only last for one year. And unfortunately, I guess we're not as popular with cops anymore because it's been quite a few years since any cops have came to me any of those. That's a real thing? Is that just... I swear to God. Yeah, it's Toronto? a real... Where is that? Yeah, no, I know. This was in New Jersey. Oh, one time it was weird. in New Jersey and one time in Pennsylvania. No, I don't... I, wow. Trust me. Cops in Toronto, we do not have the same relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Historically, nowhere near as, as friendly. Um, I'd like to get one of those, one of those cards for the border. Yeah. So would I. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like I, I just went through that. We just crossed two weeks ago to go across and you know, like, you know, you do all the checks before you go there. Like, okay, 
You know, not, what do I have here that's going to draw attention to me? And of course, the book I end up bringing down there yeah. to read is Cannabis as Soma, A History of <laughs> Cannabis in Religion. Wow. Yeah, that'll do it. Oh, <laughs> uh, we, we, I, I, I was juggling that book the entire time we were pulled in for interrogation. Just like, <laughs> don't let them see the spine. Don't let them see the cover. Don't let them see the spine. Don't let them see the cover. <laughs> Uh, if any border guards are listening to this, uh, that never happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, where did you go from there? Like from MDC? Um, or I guess at this point you and George paths are kind of like aligned. Yeah. That, we were aligned before, but George was always, he was always testing new waters. And I was, I was just straight up, you know, speed and thrash metal. Don't fucking veer from that path. That's the best. I, um, I, I thought a lot of the, you know, at the time, I thought a lot of the punk bands I had heard at that point, like Ramones or whatever, it was it was too jangly mm-hmm. and not uh, probably just not. Um, there was enough rage uh, prior to that, but then we started to get into. I started to hear some of the bands Jordan was listening to, and there was a little more cr- crossover. Crumb Suckers, Coc, Dri, obviously, uh, all that stuff was you know pre pre true crossover when things kind of got a little murky there. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was all very exciting. It had all the elements, uh, of, like I say, urgency that the metal bands had, but they had, you were able to sit there with the, with the lyric sheets and kind of sit there and think about things, Mm -hmm. which, you know, um, a lot of the metal records I listened to, didn't really have that you would it, it was almost you know fantasy world kind of stuff um again in retrospect they had some you know, you know there's some some songs about resisting power and stuff like that but a lot of it was just about death and satan which i love also yeah but uh um but this was just a new thing mm-hmm. it felt you know it felt different it felt different to, when you at that age when you feel like you have a new idea it's it's a exciting feeling absolutely so were you into the chromags at all at this point because i know ultimately you guys cover them and yeah or this later where that would in later on i guess no george got he was like fucking ground level with age of coral yeah and uh i thought it was i thought it was really cool um i probably didn't buy it until a couple years later yeah um but he had it right there we listened to it and uh i knew that was i knew that was a special record too but it was uh it was not, there was something dull about, I think it was the recording quality, actually, now that I think about it, now that I'm saying this out loud. That's why they always say the demo and, uh, is the, the way better version, right? Yeah, you know, I like, I almost like the record better. I have the demos too, but I, but I, I can hear why people would say that because they are more in your face. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, Chromags, my God. <laughs> did you Another go to that, record. did you go to that show in Winnipeg? Because they, they that famous bootleg from a Winnipeg show. No, that you know, I moved into Winnipeg the day uh, they were playing with GBH and Corpus Vile at the Rendezvous. The day I moved into the city, they played Wellingtons. I think the night before. Yeah, that's that bootleg at Wellingtons. Yeah, and I moved in. I moved into the city, got on the bus, went downtown, got off the bus, uh, saw a poster on a you know a telephone pole or something that said GBH, Chromax, Corpus Vile with the Rendezvous, and I'm like, I was 15 years old, thinking. I don't know where I am. I don't know where this is. I don't even, I don't, I didn't even know if I was allowed to take the poster off the pole. I was, <laughs> I was, you know, I was, I was a fucking country bumpkin and I, and there's no way my mom was going to let me go to that. I mean, previously uh, two, two years before that in Portage, I was crying because my mom wouldn't take me into Winnipeg to see Venom and Slayer. Uh, and I, I knew she wasn't going to let me go see a fucking <laughs> bunch of skinheads from New York city going mental at the rendezvous so no i wish i that would have been amazing but i did not go to that i had friends who were at it and uh there's mixed reviews about you know the real life version of it yeah of course it wasn't quite as exciting as the yeah um what were your first shows like what shows were you were there shows going on uh, before you moved into winnipeg that you were going to or yeah we went to we saw we went to stretch marks that was i think that was probably our first the first show me and George went to awesome for real. It was, it was, uh, we were from Portage. We were wearing hockey jackets. We thought we looked older. We went to Wellington's, um, there, they had an RCMP officer at the door 
to make sure kids didn't get in, he went to the can and the skinhead working the door let us in <laughs> and told us to go sit in the corner. And we went and sat in the corner for six hours. We saw followers and slaves, Silent Asylum. No, Silent Asylum. I think Silent Asylum and stretch marks. And it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was a crazy situation because it was also a bar yeah. in, down t- in downtown Winnipeg. And we were kids from Portage. So, um, but it was a point, it, again, it was a point where, I mean, stretch marks, they were like a Western Canadian prairie punk band. And that was even, uh, had less of the hallmarks of metal and hardcore than, than, um, than the, the punk bands from other places. You know, there's a, there was a real distinct Western Canadian punk sound, I think. Well, I think it's also, I, I don't know if you're talking about the same thing, but it's almost like that kind of drum beat that mm-hmm. I, I would say it proliferates all, all over Canada around that time. That almost yeah, like, like a straight, like a, a rock, yeah. like a rock thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, almost like an SSD record, except not as heavy, uh, drum wise. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was more like rock and roll and I, I liked it and it was exciting to see it live, but, um, it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't MDC. No, I, and to, to be honest, it was, it, when people talk about the old Winnipeg punk and hardcore scenes, everybody venerates the early, the early eighties, mm-hmm. you know, as the golden, the golden age for me, the golden age was about 86 to 88, early 89, when he had bands like um, Artificial Life, Global Genocide, Crown of Thorns, Corpus Vile, DAC. That, to me, that was the best because that was when the punk bands got faster, got heavier. Just, it was a little more youthful sounding at that point. Yeah, like and, I like. Uh, I love that personality crisis record and stuff, um, and and the low life seven inch and all that stuff. But you're right, yeah, like, that yeah. stuff is where yeah you can hear like it it starts coalescing a little bit more and becoming a little heavier. Yeah, and I mean Lance from Low Life went on to Crown of Thorns, who were from eighty six to eighty eight were they were the sh- or eighty nine even were the shit in Winnipeg. They were the it seemed like they were going to be like Metallica at the time. Did they put out a record? No, they didn't. They only did a demo. Oh, okay, because I know oh, Dangerously American. Corpus Vile. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, D- DAC had a, a seven-inch Artificial Life had a seven-inch. Yeah. Corpus Vile actually put out a record on Fringe. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I got they, a test press of that recently at a record me store. Me too. Oh. <laughs> it's, yeah. I actually have the uh, the original mix before they got signed to Fringe. It's a different mix. Really? And uh, yeah, I've, 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 I've written Brian Taylor a few times over the years trying to get the master tapes, which every time he tells me that they don't exist anymore, but I keep persisting for some reason. That and Guilt Parade. I try to find out who has the master tapes for those records. Oh, yeah. But uh, Corpus Vile were the only only one of those bands to put out a full LP. But the, the DAC 7-inch and the Artificial Life 7-inches are amazing. The Beach Mutant 7-inch is am- oh, amazing. Fantastic. I love that 7-inch. Yeah. If you, if you can ever find a copy of the Global Genocide Facts of War cassette, that's the only thing they ever put out. Uh, it's fucking unreal. Um, yeah, that, that was my golden era for Winnipeg. So that's your scene, right? Like that's, those are the bands that you kind of like come up in, like going to see, I guess. Going to see, but th- this is before I was in a band. Yeah, no, I mean, but like, yeah, yeah. This, so this was, this was your scene, I guess that you were going to these shows. Yeah. Were, were, at what point are you playing? Are you like, are you playing already? Well, me and George are playing, you know, we have ideas and we have jammed a few times and we, we know the, you know, we want to call something propaganda or, or whatever, but, uh, we weren't playing out. We had no friends. We didn't know anybody. Uh, you know, it wasn't till, it wasn't till 88 or 89 that we actually got somebody to come play bass for us. And that was, uh, Scott Hopper who what, had been in global genocide and amorphic disunity. And, uh, it wasn't till, I don't think we played our first show till 1990. Oh really? Um, so you, the same year you guys did the the first demo. The uh, first demo was was late eighty eight or early eighty nine, I think. I th- um, well, I'm 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 not calling you on this, but I'm just pulling out my copy right now, Chris, to check. <laughs> uh, Which what's your what's your tape called? Uh, propaganda. Oh, on the tape itself. Yeah, is it? They don't get paid. They don't get laid. Yeah, it's the, it- it, it's the it's the uh, uh, we don't get paid. We don't get laid. And boy, are we lazy. And what year does it say? 1990. 
Oh fuck! I thought I had more cred than that. Oh well, hey, I'm 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 not calling you because I also today I'd always heard that you guys formed in 1989, and then I read on the internet you guys formed in 1986. Yeah, but it, again, it was like me and George in Portage. Hey, we're a band, and then we you know we didn't really have any serious songs until '88. You know, when we were both in Winnipeg. And, uh, well, I would say that demo you have was probably, well, I thought it was recorded in 89. Maybe it came out and I don't fucking know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to also ask you, there's like, uh, now I got to do that. Oh, sorry. One sec again. It's like, uh, on 10 tapes O'Connor records. What's that in reference to? Oh, 10 tapes O'Connor. That is, I, oh, that's hilarious. Wow. That's bringing back some memories. I haven't seen that tape in many, many years, but that's, um, we used to have nicknames for everybody in the scene. Um, we didn't know anybody, but we yeah. had nicknames for everybody. And that was the guy, that was the skinhead that worked at Fantastic Records on uh, Notre Dame. It, it's, funny. <laughs> it's funny that you say that, because like me and my brother, who was the first person I really kind of started going to shows with, my younger brother and some friends, we all had nicknames for people. You know, it's like weird that you do that. It's, I guess it's a universal yeah. punk thing to kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, especially if you're if you're more of an observer in the scene, like you go to the yeah. shows and you look around, and you see the people doing all this cool stuff, and you're like, "Hey, there's that guy. There's yeah. that guy. They yeah. never see us. They never talk to us. But that's that guy. Let's we better have a name for him so we know who we're talking about." <laughs> yeah. If only that skinhead knew his important yeah. place in Canadian music history, <laughs> uh, <laughs> starting it all off. So, uh, so you guys start you you and George start playing together and. Uh, I guess get a band. I, I, if I'm jumping and skipping anything important as far as other bands that you wanted to talk about or touch on, please, we can go back and talk about them. As sure. Well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess you guys start playing and, and start forming a band and, and, uh, you know, and I guess three years, four years later, play a show. Yes, that is pretty much accurate. In, in that meantime, like George was in a band, he played in a high school band that played a few punk songs, probably in 80, 87 or 88 um called the ditch pigs and okay then i played i played in uh um the post global genocide band crawl okay uh that was the first show i played what um, was that show that we played with uh gorilla gorilla who's uh, biff naked that's ken jameson yeah biff naked that was her band we played with gorilla gorilla and uh and also limos in gorilla gorilla too for like no effect that's right it. He, yeah, he played drums, and uh, it was a wild show, man, to be, play your first show. Oh, and uh, we played with Immortal Possession, which was oh. uh, Evil Chuck, uh, kind of a Winnipeg metal legend. They played, and it was fucking packed, and people were going mental. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a crazy memory, but then they <laughs> that all faded, and we started our own thing. Wow, okay, yeah, so you guys started your own thing, and... You know, uh, I, it's it's actually amazing this demo how realized <laughs> it is. You know, um, and I it, it, this is also on the double seven inch, right? That Recess Records put out eventually. Oh, probably. I apologize for that too. <laughs> it's okay. I bought one version on Recess Records where it's actually both the same seven inch on diff on it, different colored vinyls. But I'm stoked. I, that I, doesn't surprise me. I'd still buy that again. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm acting like I'm above buying multiple things of the same version. But, <laughs> um, but any, but like, it's, it's crazy. You guys have songs that are like, you know, like pretty, pretty like, so, so those are the types of songs you guys were writing right away. Like, I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is when did you get politicized? Like, like so politicized. Um, well, when was that? I guess, I guess the, how many years from that MDC? I guess it was just, you know, from that MDC record till that moment of, um, of making that demo. Um, it was just, and maybe also at the time, bad, the first bad religion record we had heard, mm -hmm. uh, the suffer record. And, uh, I, I guess just in there, just in that, in that short amount of time, we, we just thought Oh, and Guilt Parade. I mean, Guilt Parade was a was a huge influence. We, when we started the band, we thought we thought that's what we were gonna do. We were gonna be like Guilt Parade. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, like the we we thought that LP was they were what we looked to when we made all those original songs. We thought, well, yeah, it's you know they're funny, but they're 
their songs mean something and they're fucking, they have this metallic edge to it, but they're punk and they're hardcore. Did they make it out to do that? Had you seen them play already by this point, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. We had seen them. They came through like three or four times through Winnipeg and I went every time. Um, they had a different lineup each time too. Yeah. Um, Dallas Good from the Sadies was in the last lineup he was telling me when he was on oh, the really? show. Oh, really? Yeah. When he was on the show, he was like, he, one of his favorite bands too. And he's like, yeah, I played in Guild Parade in the last lineup. Oh, no way. I probably saw him play then. Yeah. I don't know if he, he might have, yeah, I guess he did do the tour. So yeah, probably. Huh. Yeah. I loved, I loved Guild Parade. No one, no one really came out to see them when they came here. But uh, we always made the trip out because they were like, to us, it was like the Canadian Dead Kennedys. And we thought there, we were hoped that there was going to be more from them, but there never, there never was. Were, were you vegan by this point or? No, I think a vegetarian. I didn't even know what vegan was until the early 90s. Well, I didn't know what veganism was till propaganda. So you have me be. <laughs> um, uh, I guess, uh, like, I, <laughs> which is funny because, like, I guess I'm fascinated by this because, like, if you talk to anyone, kind of kind of my generation on in punk rock it's like when did you become political it's like oh when i heard propaganda so it's always like fascinating to hear you know where where the the politicizing force got politicized right yeah well i got i I guess the credit goes to that mdc record obviously obviously the thoughts weren't fully formed um by the time we put out those well many of our records i would say but uh uh, we're, we're still a work in progress on that front, I would say. I think all bands are, but normally it's a <laughs> it's a regression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, so from that uh, demo, I guess you guys are playing out. What's your What's the first propaganda show? First propaganda show was two nights at the Albert Royal Albert Arms here in Winnipeg with uh, Grog and Immortal Possession. Wow. That's pretty yeah. crazy for two night stand for your first two shows. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Wayne Wayne Towns, who the legendary owner of mm-hmm. the Albert, gave us our usual uh, twelve of uh, Labatt's fifty for the two <laughs> nights, and, and gave us a room to sleep in. I think that nobody in the other bands dared to sleep in. <laughs> Did you guys but, stay? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so it was very exciting back then. It's so exciting. Yeah, to, to be playing at the Albert and staying at the Albert, and it was crazy. It was a crazy time. What was that night like? But, uh, was it a a, a venture filled night of people knocking on the doors and such? Or no, it was it was very quiet, um, and I th- and very uncomfortable. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was cold and dreary, and I think we wished we were at back in our fucking hovel on Beverly Street at the the time <laughs> um uh, so uh what and i guess you guys played with fugazi pretty early on too or yeah yeah that was a that was crazy that was probably our third or fourth show wow uh we we knew a guy who at the time was you know putting on shows um and he like, he got us on a rise show remember rise from i think they're from toronto yeah were they from montreal no montreal. Like, montreal, or montreal yeah they were i loved they had an ep you know, I thought was amazing. Rise Fugazi was, I mean, that was crazy to play that. Uh, what else happened then? Were you a Fugazi I mean, fan? Were like, was that a band for you? That was, that well, they, they, yeah, yeah. They were another, uh, they were another band. Well, I, 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 the first two EPs, I was like, wow, this is, this is weird. This is, oh, I like this. This is weird. I can't believe I like this. This isn't metal or hardcore. Hmm. What's going on here? Why do I like this? Yeah. And then, and then I kind of, to be honest, I lost track of Fugazi um, after those first two EPs. I think it was Margin Walker and what was the other one? Waiting uh, Room EP? Is that the... Yeah, I, I don't know. Is that what's... Yeah, those ones. And then through the 90s, I totally ignored it while everybody was going crazy about it until they put out uh, the Argument LP, which I thought was their crowning achievement uh, in 2000-something. Yeah. And then I, yeah. So I, I'm familiar with those records in the 90s that they made because everybody fucking played them all the time. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but I was, I was sort of a ground floor and then top floor and I missed all the floors in between mm-hmm. uh, as far as sitting down with their records goes. So but they were, they were also a band that I, that I thought, um, I felt a strong, uh, respect for and on, on some level felt like, you know, they're doing the way they do things is, is more interesting than the way, uh, people are telling telling 
asking us to do things or that most bands do things. So in that sense, I, you know, they're very important. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I guess like around this point, or maybe it's a little later on, there's that the weirdest entry in the propaganda discography, I think is that, that three-way split that came out with birth fanzine. Oh yeah. 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 John Bartles, John Bartles, Sockeye, and us. <laughs> yeah, what like Propagandi and Sockeye never shall the two meet. Yet on a split <laughs> in 1991, they did. Um, yeah, how did that come about? And that is that that's the first record, right? That's the very first thing we ever did. Yeah, as far as outside of cassettes, yeah, on our own. Um, I think it was just songs from one of those cassettes, maybe our second cassette. Um, but it, we knew the guy. Uh, what was his name? Chris. Oh yeah. Chris East. Mm-hmm. Chris East was his name. He lived in um, Pennsylvania. He had the zine. I think he was a really wealthy kid. Well, was a pretty pro. Remember he had, yeah. And he, 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 he would phone me all the time and he said, he's got this, I don't, I don't know if we called them SUVs at the time, but he described this vehicle to us. He's like, yeah, my dad, he's given he gave me a gas card. I didn't know what that was, but it's free, free gas in this brand new vehicle to take us on a, a tour all across America that never happened. This never happened. But yeah. at the time we were like, what the fuck? This guy is fucking hooked up. <laughs> but he, he also had the, he had the, uh, the money to make a seven inch back then. We certainly didn't. We didn't even know how you did it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a, it was interesting seven inch. I like the John Bartle song. I remember all those songs. They were, it was a memorable seven inch for sure. It's a very memorable else. seven inch to say the least. And I think it's also memorable because, well, it, it's just like so obscure. Uh, but number two, it's also memorable because it's also like got like once again, like a bunch of songs that, uh, are kind of like quote unquote classic early propaganda songs, including a song that I'm sure has plagued you so much. <laughs> Like, uh, Scott sucks, which, uh, which one? <laughs> yeah, obviously that's a, a song, but, uh, and, and I know you've talked about it on, on, on your own podcast and things like that, but I thought the hilarious thing about it is that reaction song that that Winnipeg ska band to it did to it. Oh yeah. Hey, Chris Cannon, um, does ska really suck? Yeah. I, I, I actually, I felt. I felt more embarrassed for them than I did for me at that point. Yeah, I did too. They, they, <laughs> I think they performed on Speaker's Corner at one point. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that I remember, song? Yeah. I remember watching oh, Speaker's no. Corner one day and they're like, hey, we're playing a show tonight at the Horseshoe. It's like a new music Tuesday uh, with Bookie uh, come out. And then <laughs> to the sky. Hey, Chris Hanna, the sky really suck. Oh, boy. But they didn't oh, go boy. into the uh, the propaganda breakdown at the end, though, because it was acoustic. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> 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 um, it's it, like, uh, you know, and, and I think now history has kind of, uh, bore you correct <laughs> on this one. Like everything you said in that song kind of turned out to be really true. Um, but in the nineties, that was, I imagine. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, in Win- Winnipeg, you did not say that. No. We had, a, we, had, we had a bizarre, a bizarre scene that was ruled, ruled by skinheads. Um, skinheads who who um, identified as ska fans and who at the same time were wearing screwdriver shirts um, and toying around with, you know, white pride shit. Yeah. Um, and that, but that is why we wrote it because the scene was dominated by skinheads. We fucking hated it. Mm-hmm. Fucking hated them. And um, I remember when a bunch of fucking goofs came through Winnipeg, um, probably 89 or 90. Just, you know, probably the same year we're, we're starting the band under playing shows because uh, the whole scene was cowed, you know, just fucking scared of these skinheads. They, they would just march into a show, start kicking ass or whatever um, inside and out of the shows, which it was kind of exciting looking back. But uh, at the time, it was just pissing us off. Yeah. The, the imbalance of power and, and a bunch of fucking goofs came to town and these fucking skinheads tried causing shit at their show. And a bunch of fucking goofs kicked their asses oh, yeah. out of the venue. And I was like, fucking rights, man. And, that, and then we were like, that's it. Let's, we just got to, we got to fucking do what we can, you know? And what we, as Pencil Night Geeks, what we could do was just uh, mock them. Yeah. And, well, and I mean, it was, it was misguided. And, uh, I mean, it, it got under their skin, but that song wasn't meant to be heard by anybody but skinheads at the Albert, really. 
Well, so. that's, that's the thing is like that song obviously was written. It's amazing when you write something for a certain size of audience and yeah. that, and then all of a sudden it becomes something that goes on way, way beyond that. Um, yeah. The same can be said for the, in, in some sense for the song, there's a song on that same record, Haile Selassie, Up Your Ass or yeah. whatever. That, that song was never meant to be, that was, that song the, the genesis of that song was getting in a, in a fight, an actual fight with a local band, um, uh, the, this homophobic band that was playing a bad brain song that, you know, don't blow no bubbles as, you know, um, as an homage to homophobia. Yeah. And, and it just, you know, I might, because I was such a big bad brain fan. I against I was another record that, that was transformative in my, in my musical evolution. And I was so disappointed when that, when quickness came out and that song was on there and I realized what it was about and heard the stories from Dave Dick, Dichter later in the early nineties, cause they came through and stayed at our house and played in Winnipeg and uh, hearing the stories about how bad brains treated them. You know, it was, it was so disappointing. So that song was sort of written for, again, an audience in Winnipeg and it, it kind of, it blew up into something I, we probably didn't want it to be. We sing different lyrics to it now. Yeah. Um, some different lyrics, just, just to, just to put it in proper context. But yeah, that was the, the, all the songs. Everything we wrote back then was just meant to be played at the Albert. We didn't, yeah. we had no ambition beyond that. We had no idea anybody besides the 10 people that would come see us at the Albert, which included nine skinheads, would ever fucking hear it. But there, you know, it's funny cause there, but there are some universals that you're, you're, you're singing to in those songs even like, and I know, you know, obviously the message, you know, you, you wish you could say it differently. Believe I have a whole record of messages. I wish I could say differently now, um, myself, <laughs> nowhere near as eloquently as you did. Um, but, but it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, cause you know, you think about that and then, then you think about like, yeah, there's, there's hypocritical, like the skinheads that liked ska music, but they were kind of like sketchy white power dudes in every scene, you know, um, mm-hmm. except Toronto, we didn't really have a lot of that because the BFGs really dealt with right. a lot of the skinheads. And so it wasn't really an issue except for a couple shows ever in Toronto. Um, as far as I can remember at least. Um, but it, it, it's, I, 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 with, with the, the songs becoming popular, I guess, when did you first play with no effects? Um, that would that have been 92? Two? Okay. Or, or 91. Uh, had you Samson toured? was in the band, John. Uh, we had done like, uh, no, we, we had played like out to Regina. Okay. Maybe, maybe played Brandon or something like that. We'd never gone on a, on a full tour. That wasn't even something we thought was, could ever, well, no, we probably thought that could happen. There was, that was the age of book your own fucking life and stuff. So, um, but yeah, we played with them in 92. And then I think after he expressed interest in us, we, we booked a tour out to San Francisco, not <laughs> didn't even contact him when he went out there, just went there and came home. Um, but, uh, but that was cool. That was our first show ever in the States was with Jawbreaker. Wow. In, uh, in Rapid City. Yeah. That's and awesome. It was a, yeah. Yeah. It was a crazy night. Um, yeah. <laughs> So did you like, so you, you, you guys just decided that was your first foray across the border too? First foray across the border. Borders were very different then. Yeah. We, you just drove, drove to some fucking small town in Southern Manitoba at 9 PM as the guy's getting off his shift and just basically let you through on a dirt road and into, into the States you went. But, uh, we didn't, we didn't really, it was, I mean, we got, it was so poorly booked. We did it ourselves. We got paid, I think, one bottle of wine on the whole trip or something. I don't know. <laughs> were, you, were you with another band or by yourselves? No, it was just us. Yeah, we yeah we had we had a cassette to show people, or that was about it. <laughs> so, what were those shows like? Obviously, the first show with Jawbreaker was probably pretty good around that time. I imagine Jawbreaker had a fan base. Yeah, it was. Sm- I mean, it was small DIY Rapid City, South Dakota. But Rapid City at the time was sort of it was kind of like a a, a a minor mecca outside of Berkeley. Rapid City, you know, was the place to go if you were a touring punk band, which is very strange now because no one 
speaks of Rapid City in, in that way. Was it was anymore, skiing but, uh, records for, from there or something? Skiing record. Well, I, re- I remember um, that, that that was that label I, that the, put the Green Day first seven inch and the Fuel split with Flag Camp, I think. Oh yeah, that maybe. I remember they had a Berkeley. It was like a Berkeley Minnesota connection between the two, but maybe it was South Dakota. Oh Minnesota, okay, Minnesota. That might have been. Was that meant? Yeah, probably Mankato or something. Oh, okay, maybe that's um, what I'm thinking of. But uh, no, Rapid City just had. It was known for putting on for bands coming through. It was somewhere to go, you know, between in Washington and Minneapolis, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but it was cool. It was really very, very, very memorable show with Jawbreaker. They were awesome. They, I remember the the singer came up as we finished and said, keep playing. We never get to play with good bands. And we were <laughs> blown away because we were huge Jawbreaker fans. I'm not sure if he actually meant it or if he needed some time to go smoke a doobie or something. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it definitely stayed with us. <laughs> I was going to say Blake's very genuine in my experience too. So I, 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 th- I, I would like to think that he was being genuine in that, not just smoking weed. Uh, if it was me, yeah. it might be a weed excuse though. I got to say, because it's <laughs> something on my mind a lot these days. Um, uh, so you, I guess you go out to San Francisco. Did you play with any other bands out on the way? Anyone else that stood out to you or was it just kind of like the slog? No, we played with, uh, uh, well, not not scared straight face face down. Uh, do you oh, remember yeah. a band from from Cincinnati or or somewhere in Ohio? What are they called? Face no face value. Face value. Tony Urba's band. Yeah, it was like a their straight edge hardcore band. Uh, yes, Tony Urba from the H one hundreds, the bass player of the H one hundreds, and he played bass in Nine Shocks Terror, but he used to be the lead singer of that band. And, oh really? Yeah, and like were... he's a real, real hyper, hyperactive, yeah. talkative guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. We he it was that was funny. We played to uh, we played in a bar, maybe Eugene, Oregon. It was I don't know where it was, and uh, I think it might have been called Stinkies or something. And um, there was nobody there except some locals who were not interested. And then I remember <laughs> him when we played. He was super interested, like right into it and going crazy and was a really nice guy um but they were kind of <laughs> they i mean we didn't know what to think of straight edge hardcore back then we thought it was very strange yeah um i, I, don't, so. I don't think he was straight edge much longer after that band <laughs> he's oh. he's definitely he's been on the show too he's uh the h100s i don't know if you're familiar with them but they are no they are one of the most uh, amazing american rock and roll bands ever <laughs> like just oh really oh their shows are some of the most terrifying experiences <laughs> that can be oh, legendary, legendary band. Uh, I, I think you should check oh, them out. I, I, I will definitely. It's interesting. That's uh, I'm what a, that is not what I would have expected uh, that band to go on to. <laughs> no. And I was going to also say cool. he's very, uh, a very interesting guy. Cause like the whole time he's into that youth crew stuff, he's also super into like international hardcore. And so the H 100s, are completely informed by like Japanese hardcore and like Italian super raw hardcore. So it's like blazing, like just, oh, it's awesome. <laughs> I don't want to. Oh, is it, is it, is it sort of like, you know, Devin Morph's stuff? Like, uh, what's his band? Um, fuck. No, I blanked on it. Uh, but he does. His oh, oh uh, under pressure. Japanese hardcore. Which one? Under pressure. No. I don't think it is it like, under pressure. Winnipeg, I don't fucking Winnipeg know. band, like, Japanese hardcore influence. I know, yeah, I know the band. You're, oh yeah. no, I'm, I'm talking about. You remember Devin Morph used to write for MRR. He was in All You Can Eat. Oh um, okay, yeah, yeah. He was also in What Happens Next. I think. What happens next? That's it. Yeah, it's is it's it, it, it's kind of like that. More more blown out and blazing than that even, and it's like. Oh, cool. Yeah, like it's, it, it, uh, the lyrics are insane. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's something that you will find fairly interesting, but it's, it is awesome that Propagandi and Face Value played on, in like 1992 <laughs> together. That is so wicked. Um, yeah, I wonder if he remembers it. I, I don't know. I've got next time he, he's supposed to come back on the show because uh, we did we, we he we tapped out at an hour and a half last or two hours last time and then so he's like we we got we're gonna, he's going to come back on the show so I'll, I'll definitely believe me that is going to be something that comes up. Uh, so you get out to uh, to to San Francisco and did you like just reach out to Mike when you get out there or? No, we didn't at all. 
oh, which didn't. is, you know, just a, <laughs> another, we just didn't, we never, we've never done anything. We've never done anything smart. We've never done anything that, that, um, that would, you know, any networking kind of stuff. Yeah. We've always been very poor at that. And in a way, I think it's, it ended up serving us well, but, um, it wasn't very smart at the time. <laughs> was that the no, goal? He just though? kept he kept bugging us. He just kept phoning us, and we were like, "Geez, uh, this guy is serious." So, and I would I would tell him, I'd say, "You know, we could. I got a four track recorder here. We can make a seven inch." <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, no, no. That's not how I want to do this label." We thought he was crazy, and he he offered us. Uh, he said he'd pay for six days down at West Beach Recorders if we could. I think if we. If we would make our way down there, he he would pay for that, and we thought this is fucking crazy because uh, I was a big fan of the Suffer record. At that point, I thought the Rip No Effects Rib record was really cool, and those were both done at West Beach. So we just couldn't we couldn't believe somebody was gonna do this for us. So what did he have out by this point? Was it like just the Longest Line and Lagwagon? I or? think Longest. I I think so. Yeah, I think that was it. Um. Yeah, that was it. I, I actually liked that Longest Line record a lot, too, yeah. at the time. Uh, so it, it was all very exciting. But it didn't. I didn't really think it was going to go anywhere. I yeah. just thought, this guy's wasting his money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you go out, I guess, uh, had you tour- done any other tours since then, or was did you just go out again for the second time? Yeah, we no, no other tours. Uh, just played in Winnipeg, same old shit and uh got on a plane i think we yeah we got on a plane and went down to la and you know with my fucking crate solid state amp in a hockey bag and <laughs> off we went to west beach the, you, you recorded that with crate the the uh, how to clean everything's recorded with the crate yeah they laughed at me when i showed up with it man and that's, uh, we recorded our first stuff with the crate amp too see <laughs> I, I plugged this I have, I still have the amp and I plugged in it the other day and it sounds decent. And they laughed at me when I showed up with it. And then they plugged it into somebody's marshable. We can do that. <laughs> That's awesome. Holy Jesus. I had, Great. I had no idea. I had no, I had no idea there was a difference between a, I didn't know what a tube amp was or a solid state. Amp. I didn't know anything. We knew nothing about anything. Yeah. I think so, we're in the same and, position. And <laughs> That's reflected. I think in the, some of the early records. Well, I, I well, I think that record is a is a stone cold classic, and I can I can remember the moment I bought it and everything like that. But this is not the Damien Abraham podcast. So, when you guys finished it, what did you kind of <laughs> think this was going? What was going to happen to it? Like, did, were you guys just like, well, that's it? Yeah. Well, I I knew it wasn't it because halfway through the recording, I walked into the room with. Um, a, a, a contract saying, Hey, you guys sign this for the next record. And, uh, we were just like next record. What the fuck's this guy talking about? We're not even done this one. <laughs> but I guess he, at that point, at that point, he, he thought, okay, this is going, this is sounding how I want it to sound or whatever. Yeah. He thought that there was some potential. We were just, and I think we just felt, honestly, we, we felt, uh, we felt, we felt totally put on the spot but we, we just didn't want to be rude and not sign the guy's paper who had just flown us down here to make these songs. So we just signed this thing without even reading it really, you know, mm-hmm. <coughs> but it turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so did, so by this point was he, was he producing it and Ryan green? Was that who produced the first one? No, it was, it was Donnell Cameron. Okay. He did all the, all the classic West beach stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, he's a, Mike, Mike was there and was there pretty much the whole time. And, uh, I, I, we didn't know what a producer, what we didn't know what producing was. We Mm -hmm. didn't know anything about that. So he would come in and tell me, you know, suggest something. And I would look at him like, what the fuck are you doing in here? (laughs) And then, you know, but he had a couple suggestions that I think were, were helpful. And the rest, I think we just ignored thinking, yeah. Why, why is he here? Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What was like, we, we truly had no idea. What was your relationship? Like, you mentioned you liked the rib record. What did you think of no effects prior to this? 
as, as like a as a band? Um, well, I thought the stuff before Ribbed was I did I wasn't I thought it was not very good. You're not a Mystic Seven Inch uh, fan then? No, I did not like that at all. I didn't like S and M Airlines. Um, I didn't like Liberal Animation. Um, I thought it was all missing the mark. But the Rib record, I thought, uh, I thought it was really good. I thought, yeah. but it had it was it was kind of doing what 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 I to, to me when I first heard Bad Religion, Bad Religion Suffer, I thought this is Motorhead and the Ram- Ramones perfectly mixed, and um, and No Effects just added this, you know, that that RKL ish influence was a little more metallic and i thought thought that was great um and you know all the novelty stuff on there was at the time i thought ha, that's funny uh yeah liked it. i thought ribbed i still think i think ribbed is their best record i think it's the best record they ever made i think uh because because of the time i got into it i'm gonna have to say uh punk and drublick but i, I will go rib number two for me Cool. <laughs> that's just me. But that's what I told you I was going to find a way to put myself into this as much as possible. <laughs> um, so, like, did that record immediately get a big response or was it like something? And how aware were you of even a response that it was getting when it came out? Um, like the How to Clean record? Yeah. Um, not, not really. We didn't really. We expected nothing. And, uh, and we didn't really know what was going on. We weren't, we actually weren't that interested. Um, at the time that scene that was taking off the, you know, the fat <clears throat> records and epitaph scene was not, it wasn't interesting us besides, you know, those records I had mentioned. Yeah. And we were becoming more interested in, in the scene that was kind of evolving around, um, at least not musically, but, but, you know, uh, idea wise that was revolving around bands like born against and drop dead. Um, that seemed more, uh, it, it, that seemed to have more, um, it was more value driven, mm-hmm. um, than it was just, you know, fucking schlocky, uh, goofy skate punk kind of stuff, which I, I mean, clearly we were in that genre once that record came out. Um, for better or for worse, but we didn't really, we, we weren't from California. We didn't have any of those sensibilities. We were far more interested in what was going on in the basements and the VFW halls and the, you know, the radical bookstores in in America than we were in what was happening, uh, with the snowboard video scene that was, you know, putting all these comps together with all these skate rock bands we had no interest in that so um we we were we didn't know about it and we did not capitalize from that like we we went on tours after that record came out you know two months playing in basements Mm -hmm. where all those other bands were already playing you know they were well established and making lots of money but and selling shirts and merch hand over fist and we just we were just more interested in, in the basement scene. We thought there was something more to it than uh, than just doing the fucking rock and roll shtick. When you talk about uh, bands like you know Born Against and stuff, and I think you know a, a Canadian counterpoint to me of that is almost the I Spy. And was that when did that I Spy split? Was that just after that too? That was that was ninety four. Oh, ninety four. That came out. Oh, I, wait, wait. I think wasn't it? Well, it was, yeah, well, I, I mean, I became aware of them in probably 92 or 93. Okay. And I, I, li- I lived with Todd, who was the singer for I Spy during those years. So, yeah. And I, I mean, I worshipped that band too. Um, for all the same reasons I've described for liking MDC or whatever, you know, just the, the sense of urgency. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just a very exciting band to see live. And I, we kind of, we f- fed off each other. We tried to help each other, you know, mm-hmm. support each other's bands. And we were, we were all, all more interested in that kind of underground DIY scene than we were in the, in the exploding, um, mainstream punk scene. Yeah. They were, uh, they're a band that I think is just kind of 
criminally underrated as far as like a hardcore band goes. Like the passion, just like especially on that split with you guys, like the just bleeds out so much from the vocals. Yeah, and so did you ever get to? Did you ever see them live? Never. No, I don't think they ever. Did oh, they? I don't know if they ever made it to Toronto. Or probably. If, yeah. Probably not out east, I guess. Yeah. They made it to Europe. They went they played Europe a couple times, which is crazy, and they uh did some American shows, mostly Midwest and West Coast, I think. But uh yeah, they were they were just an unpredictable explosion live. Well, actually this might be this really actually cool. might be where there's a rumor that you came to Toronto roading for some band about a year before you guys played those shows in southern Ontario. Did you roadie for them out here or something by any chance? No. There's no, like an urban no. legend that uh, that you were like, people saw you at shows in Toronto at some Winnipeg band that you were roadieing for a show in Toronto at the Elma Combo. <laughs> this is like huh. well, 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 90s folklore coming back to be uh, no. proved untrue. Unless somebody saw me and George, we were at a fail-safe show in 1986 in Toronto. Nope, no, this um, would have been way later than not that. Not that one, eh? <laughs> no, no, this was just uh, apparently a liar trying to get seen cred back then. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. Uh, well, I, I, I to, to put your mind at ease, this person I have not seen at a show since the year 1999. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know uh, where their lies got them, but apparently not still in punk. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I guess like you guys did that basement tour. Where was that basement tour after the record came out? Oh, fuck. Um, like Midwest, I guess. Yeah, Midwest. Uh, we, but we went, we went out to like, uh, I think North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, um, kind of went everywhere, Alabama, Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, did we go to Florida? No, maybe Birmingham was as far South as we got. So like pretty much a full U.S. Um, well, tour. Kind of, sort of in this weird kind of loop that I think I, I, I used to work at, at CAA. Yeah. I made the maps there for tourists. So I think I, what I did was try to make a loop that made sense with all the most, uh, the, the burgeoning punk DIY punk scenes in America. Like we, we did a lot of, St. Louis at the time was also kind of a place you had to go. There was, you know, the Meat Sisters were from there and that was kind of an exciting scene chicago los crudos yeah uh it was yeah all that kind of stuff so we tried to madison was a was another one of these towns i think was damadol from there i think damadol was from somewhere in wisconsin wisconsin had you know it's weird it's weird to think of all the little uh hotbeds of you know when you had seen reports in mrr uh coming from these small towns or places that don't really seem to have scenes now it Mm -hmm. was it's it's funny to look back and see what was an exciting place to go. It seemed like every place that had a university had some sort of punk scene. Yeah, that's probably it. Um, yeah. But yeah, like you're right. There's you, you just don't see it in the same sort of way anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the aversion though to touring Canada <laughs> at this point? We did. I don't know if we had one. We just we didn't know we didn't know how to make things happen. And it's long. Never drives. had. Probably the long drive. I don't know what the fuck we were thinking, you know? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the... F- we, we never knew what we were doing. We just made stuff up as we went along. You know, a tour we get booked, we'd be like, ah, fuck, cancel it. Let's <laughs> do something. You know, it was it was weird, you know? We just didn't... We didn't take things seriously. Um, and we didn't... We didn't put a priority on... On touring. We yeah. never have. I mean, I mean the, the past seven years is the most we've ever toured, uh, which is crazy because we have our lives so much more complicated now. Um, but that's, you know, we were just so fucking disorganized, uh, and perhaps disinterested in the kind of real work it takes to make a, to make a band work back then. We just, we were just very lucky. A lot of lucky bounces for us, as they say. Um, so, yeah, so like kind of like at, at, after How to Clean Everything comes out, did you guys kind of just keep touring regularly after that at this point, like just doing basement tours or was it? Not even regularly, no. And I think at the now that we're talking about it, I think that was part of what worked for our band. It started to turn into this pre-internet uh, 
it, you know, became this thing. Like, who is this band where they don't, they never play shows. They won't come to America. They've been banned from America. Yeah, you know, that's what I was Just snowball all these ideas. Yeah, all these ideas about why we didn't tour, why we wouldn't play certain cities. It was just pure fucking negligence. You know, we <laughs> were just ding, total, total dingbats, but people would make up these narratives about they're not coming here because uh, something happened in the scene or, or they won't play this because of this political decision that was made by the you know city hall. It's just crazy shit that would... Or they're not allowed to leave Winnipeg. Yeah. Just fucking weirdness. It was, they worked for us. It, it created this mystique for a while. You know, the same mystique that kind of propelled Venom um, back in the early 80s for a few years. Yeah, absolutely. If I may compare ourselves to Venom for a second for well, no reason. I, I was going to say the same mystique <laughs> that propelled us in the early years too. So believe me, I was going exactly, to exactly. compare myself to you guys. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Um, and, and so there is that kind of mystique about you guys and sort of these like crazy, you know, yeah, like I, urban legends and, and, and stories that begin kind of circulating about propaganda and what this band is and what these people are like and, and everything like that. So what is kind of like your mindset going into recording the next record at this point? Because you guys did some splits and or the FYP split. Was that after that? Or before that, that the FYP split was was a year after How to Clean Everything. Okay, so yeah, so as, okay, yeah, as far as I remember. Okay, and uh, and I think I think that and the next record were sort of reactions to where to the genre we suddenly found ourselves in that we didn't, you know, from the get go we felt like yeah, I don't know if we're really part of this all yeah. the snowboard shit and surfing and skateboard. I don't know. I don't know. Like people were coming up to us at these shows in California giving us boxes of skater clothes, <laughs> you know, as if we're going to fucking wear it. We're like, what are you doing, man? What are you, look at us. Fucking look at us. <laughs> and we're dressed by our mothers still. <laughs> and, and so I think that the, uh, the 10 inch and less talk more rock certainly were our most conscious reactions to how we were being perceived in the world. Um, you know, the, Let's Talk More Rock is, is the record where we, probably the only record we have where we, we had some intent on how we wanted the record to end up and, and, and be perceived uh, because we, we, re, we suddenly realized we had this platform uh, where we have this genre of people that are, you know, we played a few of the shows that those bands in California California, from California play we, we saw that the demographic was largely uh, white male um, meatheads yeah um, affluent meatheads and yeah and we and we thought well we we have to do something responsible with uh, our next record and and make sure that in no uncertain terms our our view of the world which is ironclad in your early 20s mm-hmm is um is is portrayed correctly on the record and and i thought i thought we did a, a great job of that I oh, mean, I, yeah it's, it's, there's a lot of th- cringeworthy things about about that but uh in its essence i think that if anybody asked me what i think about you know the world or whatever just say well fuck go listen to that record now that tells you exactly what i think about the world you know and I don't really need to ever make another record again. <laughs> um, but we, we keep doing it. But uh, that, that one still sums it all up for me. And, and, and the reaction to that record was um, directly or was entirely predictable in that it, it, was, it just flopped. Did it flop, um, really? Well, in... in in relation to where that scene was going and how the first record had done. Wow. Uh, really? Cause I, that to me was the record, maybe it's just, once again, because of my time, but like that record was the record where it's like that record came out and it like changed everything. Like nothing was the same after that. Like you were either on one side <laughs> or another in punk rock after that record oh, came I, out. That's cool. I like that. I like that interpretation of it. Well, it was, I guess, and, I didn't, and it, it, you had to pick a side, you know, like there's no other option in that record. Like 
it, otherwise you felt bad the whole way listening to it because like there's every song is about something, you know? And it was like, yeah. especially in a, a genre where like you're normally listening for me, it was always like, you're waiting for that one song that's about something to come on, you know, <laughs> like that. There's always like that one song on the strung out record that's ambiguously political enough where you're like, well, this is kind of speaking to something. And so those were all <laughs> the, the songs that I would get behind, but then there's a whole record of, and then the liner notes and, 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 you know, organizations and all this stuff that I could like, you know, follow up on it with. It's like, Oh, like it, it's a, it's a record that changed everything. And so I'm just shocked to hear that it wasn't that way everywhere. <laughs> well, it was, I mean, maybe it was for, I think for that demographic, it was like people who would like the first record and were like, dude, they have a new one. Let's look at it. And they looked at the record and it says, it says gay positive on the front. It says gay positive. That was like immediately uh, 50% of the people that, yeah, immediately 50% of the people who, who uh, were interested in the first one were, would not touch that. When, when I was 15, would I have brought home a record that said gay positive on the front? Not no fucking way. Not Portage La Prairie. I would not have wouldn't yeah. have touched it with a ten foot pole. And uh, I mean, it's also said pro feminist and this. You know, everything on there was 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 geared to draw a line in the sand. And the response was commensurate to that. And uh, I think it showed. You know, I mean, it's predictable that that demographic would not necessarily take kindly to that kind of broadside of. Uh, of their worldview. And, you know, it wasn't a carbon copy sonically at the first record either. You know, I decided to sing differently. I was mortified by the vocals on the first record, even back then, you know, um, they're so ridiculous, so cartoonish. And the ones on Let's Talk More Rock aren't that much better, but at least I wasn't singing in a fucking British accent or whatever was happening on the first record. <laughs> I don't hear a British uh, accent. I, I love the vocals on the first one, but hey, <laughs> it's your show. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it just was... But I mean, every record we've ever put out uh, has been dismissed offhand at first. You mm -hmm. know, Everybody who liked the one before it says, oh, this one sucks. And then six months later, people are like, no, this is, you know, this is the best one. And then happens, you know, it happens up, including the last record failed states we put out. People were like, oh, this isn't as good as the last one. And then six months later, this is my favorite one. Yeah. You know, he's, you know how that goes. Nobody's Ooh. ever, you know. Well, normally I'm just used to, this isn't as good as the last one. And that's where we, they normally check out. And we have to get a new fan to replace that person. <laughs> in my experience <laughs> thus far um where uh so because that, that and you you don't tour that do you tour out for that record immediately but you do tour out for that one we do um i think we only got one full european well full for us full like three weeks in europe before uh before me and samson started talking about you know changing stuff up you know getting a different bass player um so maybe there was only the one yeah no well i guess well once kowalski got in the band we kept playing some shows sporadically you know based on those two records we we've never really been a band that tours for the record we always i guess we do but we weren't really thinking that way yeah of promoting a record we were just playing well these are the songs we have and they're on those two records and that's what we're going to play live yeah because when did you do uh, that East Coast um, Canadian tour? Was that, that uh, I guess, a year later, maybe? Uh, where did it go to? Uh, you guys remember. came, was I remember, you played like every city in Southern Ontario two nights in a row. Um, oh, God. Yes, that tour. Um, and that, that I think was, that's Todd's, one of his first tours, right? That's one of Todd's first tours? Yeah. 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 I remember that. That was a rough one. Holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are some amazing things I want to ask you about from that tour. Um, and I, and I know I'm keeping you up pretty late and you and me both have to get up early with kids. So I promise we'll cut it early and I, and I got to do a second episode with you in the future because I could go on for sure, all, yeah. all night with these questions. No, for sure. This is, it, I, li I like it because you're triggering things I haven't thought about in a long time. Well, that's what I'm hoping to do. That's what my goal with this thing too. Um, well, speaking of things you haven't thought about in a long time, uh, that Southern Ontario tour 
is a massive tour for me and all my peers and a lot of people in Southern Ontario. Um, but did you guys tour the whole way out, I guess, from Winnipeg? We must have. We must have. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, because we played Thunder Bay. Oh, yeah, we played Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah, we played all that way out there. Th- North Bay, maybe. What were those um, shows like then? Uh, well attended. Yeah, because um, I can't say a little bit of a scene. It... Yeah, our the guy who tours with us now, um, Dave Hugel, um, he put on the shows in Sault Ste. Marie at the time. Oh, and he, I don't know if he put on our show, but uh, but uh, yeah, but I mean they're well attended, but I I can't say we were any good. That's for sure. Uh, that was we have we have if you ask Kowalski about that tour. Oh boy, yeah, it's just our it's our most dismal memory of uh, playing live. Some of those, I think playing where was that fucking place? It's just east of Toronto, Oshawa, not Ajax, Oshawa, Oshawa. Yeah, you guys played with oh. the Pre Closet Monster Band. Uh, I can't remember what they're called now. Damn it! Uh, what were they called? Anyway, the Pre Closet yeah, Monster yeah. Band opened for the one. I remember that. I remember that too. He put on the show, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For us. London. But, yeah, London. But we were, I mean, I mean, if you see a YouTube video of that Oshawa show these days, it's just so fucking dismal and boring. And, oh, God. It just well, I don't think hits that's, the worst. That's not your guys' fault. I Like, because I was at that show and I thought it was fantastic. But I really. Remember, oh, absolutely. And also, that was the day that I bought the Noam Chomsky a manufacturing consent book that completely changed everything for me. <laughs> so, Oh yeah. It's a big day for me, that show. Uh, I also bought the, okay. uh, the gay positive pro feminist shirt, uh, with the anarchy symbol on my chest. I could, uh, that was a, I got all so many vivid memories coming back. It's flooding too many feelings right now. Chris, too many <laughs> feelings. Um, but no, it was an, ama- but also just cause that time shows sucked for crowd reactions. Like people yeah. were just were like just staring at you guys. I remember, and 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 I, you know, I'm not was I wasn't trying to kick it off or set it off in any way either. But like, it was everyone was just like in awe, and and I really describe it as being in awe. Everyone's just like staring at you guys. Well, I like I like that interpretation better than <laughs> ours, which is like we like fuck we would whatever momentum we possibly had back in those days, we would you know play a song. Here's a song, and thirty seconds later. Okay, now a five-minute speech about this next song, <laughs> you know, it, and it's just if you watch, obviously, if anybody watches themselves fucking pontificating to a crowd back in you know twenty years ago, you are going to want to yeah. blow your head off <laughs> exactly to see that again. It's so brutal, <laughs> but uh, I like your interpretation better. Well, I, I was going to say Martin from Crudos is one of the few people that I've always thought just you know his speeches just always captivate and hold the attention. But I wonder, I bet you he's the same way. He goes back and watches those old ones and he's like, uh, <laughs> uh, here I go yeah, again. Uh, Kudos. They were the best. Uh, they're amazing they, band. They were de- amazing. The best. Um, so, uh, I guess on another show, speaking of, uh, the best bands and bands that would go on to become other bands, another show on that tour that you played was London, Ontario. I think you played call the mm-hmm. office and two bands open for you. One is shoulder the pre Constantine's band, the other one. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you guys like shoulder. You said so on stage. I have a live bootleg tape, uh, to verify this, but one band that you guys did not get along with that night left for dead. <laughs> Do you remember that? Really? Yeah. Left for um, dead. Left for dead. Because I think what you're saying is, you know, people began to associate you guys with a scene that nothing about you other than the first record and some of the songs on that first record spoke. To oh, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking. Yeah. I remember that show. Yeah. The and, left- and, and, and Kowalski said something about, he said, all the posers leave. Oh, no one left. I guess there's no posers here. Yeah. Or something like yeah, that. Is yeah. That- and then he goes, and then, and then you go, where was that band from? And they start yelling, Hamilton, Hamilton. And you're like, whatever. They were terrible. And then, uh, and then, and then I think George or someone says, uh, shoulder was good though. <laughs> that's <how> it starts. <laughs> that's but, weird because I, I think I, I think I remember liking Left for Dead before we even got there. Yeah, I'm sure because it, it's chokehold dudes and 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 yeah. you know and and there and I think 
it's funny because I had Chris on this podcast, and the reason I bring this up is because Chris Callahan, who's now, you know, Curse, Burning Love and everything, was the singer in Left 4 Dead. And yeah. it's amazing. And he, he was talking. He's like, yeah, I really, you know, look back on that and look foolish because it's like the one, like all the shots they were taking at you guys was because they didn't get it. And now it's like, you know, all the dust clears and it's like, what's the one band that kind of holds true? It's like propaganda. You know? And he, he kind of like admitted that on this podcast. Oh, weird. I, I didn't, I didn't even know. I can't even, well, my memory's so fucking shot. By this <laughs> well, mine's just life, so I, nerdy. I didn't, I didn't even remember them taking shots at us. <laughs> yeah, it was. I thought were... they were just taking shots at the crowd, crowd or something. But uh, now I'm really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Beef ain't over. Beef ain't over. <laughs> well, they're back together. Yeah, let's start that shit up again. <laughs> let's start it over. Oh, good. <laughs> but uh, the scene I... needs a new beef. Well, I think I think I don't know. I've having been in in several failed beefs over the years. It's it's never as fun as it looks like in the rap documentary. You know, yeah, no, it's always it always gets very tired very quickly. I've it, been in a few myself. I get I, very tired. I know, and I, I don't want to. I we can. I, I don't want to get into like not all beefs, but I want to get into all this other stuff in the future. But I guess kind of to wrap up on the two Toronto shows that you guys played, or the three. No, you guys did two in downtown Toronto. I thought it was kind of cool because. You, you did it one night with like kind of the pop punky promoters in town, like with all the bands that were kind of like, you know, definitely of the more epithet influence. But then you did another night with okay. like grade and, and Jersey who at the time were like a, a very much a DIY band. And I think Blake might've played too, who are like a, a DIY kind of punk band from Toronto. Was that kind of a conscious effort that you guys did to resist playing with the big, you know, epifat type promoters in every city um what were they were those two shows different promoters yeah i think so i think one was by you and um, who and i think one was by uh the uh, raw energy the people that did the label in town okay because i i remember the the grade show for sure because it was a friends of the lubicon benefit yeah. That's the only one. I don't remember. I don't remember the other one at all. Were they both at the Elma Combo or? Well, they were both at the Elma Combo. Different? One was downstairs. The grade show was downstairs. I was at that show. Unfortunately, the show upstairs. It was the last night I drank before I went straight edge for ten years. So I didn't make it to the next show. <laughs> but <laughs> I broke my toe that night too. Well, I don't. I I wasn't drinking that year, and I don't. I don't even remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah. show. I remember the grade show. That was the other so, thing. Uh, there was all these rumors that you guys were super straight edge. Uh, that they were going to be checking if people were in leather shoes when they came into the club that night. <laughs> uh, no, I think I, I was the only guy who wasn't drinking in those couple of years. Okay. <laughs> um, but I definitely wasn't identifying a straight edge. Well, but, uh, I, Chris, I don't think we're nearly done at all by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, I think this is a good place to end because I want to go into tons of other stuff. And, and, and this seems like a, a reasonable place to end for two people that have to get up early t- tomorrow with kids. Um, yeah, let's do it. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for being on the show, man. This has been amazing to get to do this. And uh, I cannot wait to do part two. Right on, Damien. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we'll do the uh, 1988, 1998 and on next time. <laughs> exactly. Click.